you know, there. So mean, standard deviation, t-test for lab one, keeping it really simple. And since we have such an incredibly low sample size, the chance that you're going to find significance is not very high. And that's good because we need to have enough people that it really matters. So in a perfect world for something like that, before we do any of these tests, we do what's known as a power test. And a power test is effectively you estimate how big of a difference you think something's going to make. And if it's going to make this difference consistently, then how many people do we have to have take and do the test or the intervention or anything before we think we're going to see that significance using frequentist statistics like we're using with the t-test. So you guys, in order for really to be effective, you probably needed to have more like 30 something people. Hi, Diana's roommate. You having a good night back there stretching out in the kitchen? I'll take that as a maybe. It's okay, it's okay. Everyone's welcome to my classroom. All right, guys. So uh, does, that, does that kind of give you more clarification what we're looking for in the stats? So introduction, basic context, purpose, methods is here's the number of people we had, here's the average age, average height, average weight, and then here is the test that you're going to use for your stats, followed by statistics, means, and then a Pearson, or sorry, then a uh, student's t-test was implemented to see if there was a significant difference, and then results Here's where the results were. Here's the average body comp that we did and the other values. Here's how they changed pre to post discussion. It worked, it didn't work, it kind of worked, whatever. So not looking to make it too painful. So let's go ahead and we'll switch on over to sharing my screen. And now we're gonna be talking about skeletal and So as usual guys, you have questions, you have comments, you have concerns go ahead and just um, unmute yourself and ask it. I'll have um, the participants up because I wouldn't be surprised if uh, some of our other students show up later on just because you know, it's the joys of how uh, life be going for a lot of folks with work. And then you can always also put the question up in the chat because I'll have all that going. So basic overview, we're gonna talk about the structure of skeletal muscle, proteins involved with, con with contraction, what are the cellular events that are occurring leading up to it, aka the action potential, the different fiber types and how those differences are going to affect its performance, and then some basic muscle actions you guys have seen before. So about 60% of your actual body weight is gonna be muscle. It depends on the individual. So someone uh, like uh, a really small cross-country athlete this number might actually, or not even cross country, a really small sedentary individual, it might be a lower number than this. And then if you're a really lean, massive bodybuilder, it might be getting closer to 70, maybe 80% in like obscene examples, but I even doubt it's gonna be ever that high. And a decent amount of your muscle is actually obviously made up of protein, the enzymes, the contractile units, but Still, a large component of it is essentially water. Now, we have three different types of muscle. We have smooth, which is the type that's gonna wrap around our circulatory system and our intestines, for example. We have our cardiac, which is effectively our heart, and then we have our skeletal. Now, the skeletal is the one that we tend to be the most interested in because that's the one that we voluntarily control, and, ease, and it's going to allow us to obviously move our body as we're trying to do whatever task we're trying to effectively occur. This is not the same as fiber type. That's going to be fast twitch, slow twitch, which we're gonna to get to in a little bit. So smooth is kind of interesting because its organization is it kind of looks like a diamond. So when it contracts, it actually kind of pulls through and kind of shrinks up. And that's what causes that vasoconstriction, vasodilation of it relaxing or contracting uh, respectively for dilation and constriction. Cardiac is going to branch and kind of fork over each other. Now it's still going to contract fully each time. And that netting is what obviously keeps our heart from having a hole in it, which is a good thing. And then skeletal, which is going to be striated, but it's going to be straight line. And it's also fascinating because it is what's known as multinucleated, which literally means there's more than one nucleus, which is going to be important when we talk about uh, my nuclear domain and some of the other limiting factors to muscle hypertrophy that we'll cover a little bit later on. So, 
I'm sure you guys are familiar. We've got a whole muscle which divides into fascicles, which goes into single fibers. Inside the single fibers, we have myofibrils. And inside those myofibrils, we have the individual sarcomeres. And inside of the individual sarcomeres, we have the myofilaments of our actual myosin and actin. So going from biggest to smallest. Now, what's really cool with the individual fiber is, remember, instead of a cell membrane, we call that the sarcolemma. We have what's known as T-tubules, transverse tubules. And these are holes that actually go through the muscle fiber. And this allows the signal of depolarization to go a lot faster than it would otherwise, because it's literally gonna go straight through the cell and not just around the cell. And allows for a more rapid contraction of the entire muscle fiber. So, individual unit is the muscle fiber. Muscle fiber has the plasma membrane on the outside, which we call the sarcolemma. Inside of, instead of being cytoplasm, we call that sarcoplasm. And the sarcoplasm has the T-tubules going through it and the sarcoplastic reticulum, which is where calcium is stored during relaxation to a protein known as calcisequestrin. And that's what's going to release it to let that calcium go into the sarcoplasm, bind to troponin, we'll get to the different isoforms there in a few moments, and cause contraction. Now, another component to keep in mind is we do have a wonderful calcium ATPase pump that is going to pump the calcium back out of the sarcoplasm into the SR. And if that, that's literally what helps us relax. And if we don't have enough energy, in theory, we will have a cramp. And that's actually where the vast majority of energy is actually invested when it comes to muscular contractions, getting your muscle to relax. So these filaments are going to be strands of actin that are bound together by what's known as the Z line. So it's strands of actin interlacing them and in between, we're going to have myosin. Now the myosin heads are what actually grab hold of actin and pull it into the center, grab it again and pull it into the center until effectively it's butted up and as tight as it can be if we're just talking about letting the contraction go as far as it can. Now there is obviously the different areas are, we have our eye zone, which is where the or eye band where there happens to be just actin. We have our A band where we happen to have our myosin we have our H zone where we effectively just have our myosin itself. We have the M line, which is the dead center of where there is the interlacing of the myosin. I'll, I've got that on there. There's a couple uh, homework quiz question for you guys, but I'm never gonna really make you memorize these. The key thing to understand is myosin is what's pulling it into the center and it's gonna make those Z lines butt against the end. I'm telling you, like you, we, I'm very comfortable with you know getting to know your roommate and being pleasant with her, but I don't know why she keeps running away every time she's in the back room, Diana. So, what's actually regulating our muscles from just contracting randomly is going to be tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is laying on top of actin. So if you look at our picture and you see the zoomed in, the yellow bead-like structures, those are actually actin. Now, at rest, the point of which that myosin heads would grab hold of actin is blocked by the blue line, and that's tropomyosin. Troponin is the green protein that is going to be having calcium bind to it, which will then cause it to move tropomyosin off of those binding sites, and then the myosin heads, if you picture on the upper right side of the slide that's zoomed in, that's where we're actually going to get our contraction to actually occur from, is those grabbing hold and pulling on in. Now myosin itself is weaving through itself through, out in that M line where it's linking together. And then also there's many, many myosin heads per individual myosin in the center that's grabbing and ratcheting. And the damage we're actually gonna find is mostly through Z line streaming. So that's gonna be breaking down of this black line here. Now you see this thinner line going over on either side, that is gonna be Titan. And Titan effectively works as almost like a bungee cord that's gonna help locate myosin in the center of the sarcomere, as well as gives us some of the elastic component of energy that we're gonna go ahead and get from muscular contraction. Now, also another thing to keep in mind is at the very end, so this would be the end of actin right here, that's gonna be where we would find nebulin, which is gonna function as essentially a ruler that lets us, that essentially puts the end to the actin cap so the actin doesn't keep overgrowing or some strange function of it not uh, organizing like it should. And these Z lines effectively are going to be literally linked all the way over to 
our actual sarcolemma, and that's going to be through the dystrophin glycoprotein complex and or also the costamere. And if it wasn't for that, we would literally have our muscles fall apart a lot faster just when we're trying to go ahead and do contraction. So the individual myosin with its tail and its head is going to link together, and that's what gives us that thick filament. Now you can see an even better example of troponin, the complex right there, tropomyosin is the black line, and then the bead is going to be actin. And so you can kind of see how all these interesting individual myosin heads are going to grab hold of actin and pull into the center, which is really fascinating because when myosin is contracting, it kind of follows a drill pattern of it naturally twists as it goes in and twists as it goes out. Just due to the way that those myosin heads are arranged, they effectively grab one, pull on, and then the next one grabs it, and the next one grabs, and they keep going around in a circle because there's actually going to be six actin strands for every one myosin in the middle that's going to go ahead and be pulling through. And remember, multiple myosin heads. So here's a great graphical example of how you can see that thick filaments, and then you can see the thin filaments. You can see each individual myosin is surrounded by six individual actin strands. And that's what's going to, in humans specifically, that's what's going to allow us to get that type of contractional force because it's effectively surrounded by things that you can grab hold to. So, it is actually the myosin head that's what's developing tension and is going to cause motion. That's what actually grabs and pulls. The thick filament, the tail, that effectively grabs on either, that runs the length of it. So on both ends, it's grab, I guess I shouldn't put my arms up long because they're super long. They grab and pull into the center, grab, pull into the center, grab, pull into the center by thousands of these individual myosin heads. And that's when it's going to give us force production. So inside of the myosin head, we have what's known as myosin heavy chain. And that's the obviously the biggest component of it. If I remember correctly, it's about 270 odd uh, kilodaltons in size. It's a, it's a big damn protein. Um, a Dalton is a size unit uh, specific to chemistry. And so it's 270, I think by 286 uh, kilodaltons inside. Myosin heavy chain, specifically type 2X, is the biggest of them. Um, and to give you an idea, that means, you know, of those kilodaltons, it's probably, if you took like a, a lot of other enzymes, usually your myosin is gonna be about uh, at least four to five times bigger than a lot of enzymes in the cell. I mean, it's, it's big. And that's just one myosin head. Now inside of the myosin head, it has two extra components. And these are what's known as the light chains. The light chains are both, they serve two separate functions. There's the essential, and then there's the regulatory. These also are gonna have their own potential isoforms, which are in fact going to affect speed of contraction. So it's not just your myosin heavy chain, so your type one, type two A, and type two X, like you were taught in your undergraduate X phys, it's also going to be which isoform of the essential and regulatory chains do you have that are being expressed inside of those fibers. So the analogy that I try to use for this is think of your myosin heavy chain as like your engine size. So going from a four cylinder engine, something small and weak like the one inside of Yehor's car, to like, a, sorry buddy, it was too easy, to like a big block V8, that's going to have a whole lot more horsepower and a whole lot more torque. Now think of the essential and regulatory light chain as putting in like, instead of like normal gas, putting in like ultra premium gas. Now, the ultra premium gas is going to give you a little bit more horsepower, it's going to give you a little bit more performance, but it's not going to make up the difference between having the smaller engine to the larger engine when it comes to sheer horsepower. Does that make sense to you guys? Jabbar is saying no, that's fine. Okay. So think of it along the lines of your slow twitch gives you uh, effectively a five mile an hour speed, your fast switch 2A gives you a 10 mile an hour speed, and then your 2X gives you a 12 mile an hour speed. Now, the essential and the regulatory light chain are able to increase or decrease each of those numbers by one. 
So that means with the right type of regulatory and essential light chain, that slow twitch can now go at six miles an hour. It's still slower than the 10, but it is better. But the 10 could now be an 11 and the 12 can be a 13. And those are just extra little components that once again can affect performance. That kind of cleared up a little bit better there, bud? Cool. So this right here is myosin. You guys have never had biochemistry, or I highly doubt you have, but what's really cool is this is literally how the protein is folded and put together. So each different colored strand is a different individual protein. And so anytime you see these squiggly lines, that's what's known as an alpha helices. Anytime you see an arrow going one direction and then the other, those are what's known as parallel and anti-parallel sheets. And then every time you just see a thin line with no reason behind it, that's what they call a loop. And you can literally see all myosin is, is a really, really big protein that's folded in on itself. So it's gonna have the function of being able to give us that contraction. So you can see how right over here is that essential light chain in the yellow. The regulatory chain is over here in the purple. The C terminal means that's the carbon end. And so the N terminal is the other end. Now the nucleotide, that's where actually ATP is gonna go inside and be hydrolyzed to have its effect. And then over here, the actin binding domain, that's literally where it's going to bind to actin. So now here is a not as glamorous version of it, but giving you an idea of if we're to zoom in on that myosin head and you see the light chains still, you're going to have this 50 kilodalton head where ATP is going to stick into, which is going to cause it, remember, to release from actin. And from there, it's going to hydrolyze, cause the head to go backwards. It's going to go forward again, grab and pull. So we can actually see effectively how mechanically this is working with a little bit easier of an image to uh, contemplate. Now, when it comes to skeletal muscle, we actually genetically have the ability to, uh, I think if I remember correctly, there ends up being over seven different individual human muscle fibers, uh, skeletal muscle. But as far as expression in a normal human, you're only going to find effectively three. We've got our slow twitch type one, we have our fast twitch type 2A, and then we have our fast twitch type 2X. Rats have type 2B and also some rats and cats have type 2D which is even faster than all of the above. Now you also, especially after like a major injury, and I'm talking like crush injury, something horrible happened to you, you'll see expression of myosin heavy chain embryonic isoform and myosin heavy chain neonatal, which you can guess at what point in development that's typically going to be expressed. And then the last type of myosin heavy chain, which you guys all have, is ocular. And that is a very, very fast twitch muscle fiber type and that's specific only to the muscles that actually move your eyes. Now, when it comes to our light chains, on the essential side, we have a two fast isoforms and one slow. And for the regulatory chains, we're going to have the fast and the slow. Now remember, the regulatory, that's gonna be important with the ATP hydrolysis. And then obviously with our central, that's where we're going to be interfacing. So, how this looks again. Yes, Ihor. No, I, it's all good. I was uh, moving my phone, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure if you're trying to hit the mute button. It's all good, man. So, now remember, the thing that we really care about for keeping our muscles from contracting for no reason is going to go ahead and be our wonderful troponin. Now, troponin is going to bind to calcium, which is going to move this tropomyosin, so we're going to get to the binding sites on actin. And it turns out, remember guys, we have a six to one ratio of our actin to myosin, so naturally we're going to always, we should always have more actin inside of our muscle cells than we have myosin. Now, troponin itself actually has three subunits. Troponin C, which is where calcium binds, Troponin I, where it interfaces with actin, and that's essentially the central unit, and then troponin T, which is where it actually is going to bind to tropomyosin, which in turn is going to cause it to be moved once we have calcium binding to it. So, remember, troponin is that very regulatory protein that if calcium's not, 
happen to be binding to it, it's not going to allow the binding sites on actin to become available for calcium. We are going to see that troponin T is going to bind to tropomycin, so T to T. C is where calcium, and then I, tropomycin, where there is no calcium. Once again, that is going to be the key component that's essentially in the center interfacing T and C. Now, what's interesting is there's going to always be slightly different isoforms of each of the individual myosin, heavy chains, troponins, and actins. So we also are going to have troponin, uh, sorry, tropomyosin that's both fast and slow, and the expression is going to be dependent on individual cells. Actin, we are going to be expressing most cardiac initially when we're developing, but then we become an adult, it's gonna be mostly skeleton, a skeletal. And then as far as troponin C, there's just one major form of that, and troponin I, notice how there, there's troponin T, there's a number of different isoforms that are going to be expressed at different points throughout your lifespan. Now, Titan and Nebulin are all about anchoring and or maintaining the positions. Troponin T is effectively my white whale. That's the one that I've tried to go ahead and measure a number of times. Uh, back when I was working and doing uh, bench style science and it was, I got it imaged a couple times, but it was a nightmare to do and it's incredibly, incredibly frustrating. Um, but it was a lot of fun. If I had a chance, I'd probably try to image it again, but I need to get some more sample. Now, Titan is interesting because that's going to actually be that ruler that's going to keep myosin in the center and it gives us a bit of the elastic component. And Titan actually is going to have two separate isoforms, which are going to be expressed slightly differently depending on training status, but there still needs to be more research done in that area before that type of research is going to be a little bit more clarified. Nebulin is the one that's going to regulate the length of actin. And then, like I alluded to earlier with those Z lines, they are going to be bound to our sarcolemma via what's known as the dystrophin glycoprotein complex and also sometimes referred to as the costumere. Now, this is really important because notice guys, this is that dystrophin protein is literally making up about 5% of your membrane cell, the skeletal or cytoskeleton. This is actually how we're able to transduce force because it actually is gonna be mounted to our cellular mem membrane. And if this breaks down too much, this is literally going to be what causes the muscular cell death. And this is literally the reason it's named for a dystrophin is guess what it's named after specifically when it's not functioning like it should. Dystrophy. Dystrophy. Great job, Jabari. So literally, notice Little and Duchesne were the ones that came up with the term muscular dystrophy, as in Duchesne's muscular dystrophy, which is a X. Uh, related or it's an X recessive trait, hence why if you're male, you've got a much higher chance of getting it than if you're female, because you can have be heterozygous for it and then unfortunately pass it on to your children if you have a male child. And this literally is how, this is the protein that fails effectively, that doesn't allow the muscle to be mounted to the cellular membrane like it's supposed to. And the problem is when it's not mounted like it should be, it's equivalent of an engine in a car running and not being mounted to the car's frame. That happens, it's literally going to rip itself through effectively the engine block, or not the engine block, but effectively the hood, and you'll do a huge amount of damage to your car very rapidly. And unfortunately for individuals with dystrophy, it causes them to chew through their muscle fibers faster, which in turn, unfortunately, causes them to have much shorter lifespans. So now the actual full dystrophin glycoprotein complex is notice far more involved, where we're going to have a number of different components with both fibrins and collagen uh, ex uh, expression that is going to be what's actually causing it to link to the cell. And one of my friends uh, from graduate school, a lot of his work is actually looking at integrin signaling, and those are going to be forced transducers on the cellular membrane, which are going to be activated in response to stressful training. So, the problem with this muscular dystrophy is since these fibers literally are breaking down at such a high rate, those satellite cells that happen to be effectively the stem cell precursor to muscle cells are going to bind to our muscle fibers at a much higher rate, which is gonna deplete our satellite cell uh, 
population far faster than it can recover and eventually cause exhaustion of all your body's recuperative abilities and hence functional loss of those muscle fibers with time. Now, if we're gonna go ahead and look at the molecular weight of some of these proteins, notice once again how big myosin is and how it's going to make up the vast majority of the protein in skeletal muscle. And it's still gonna make up a component. Yehor, if your computer's giving you trouble, please have yourself on mute whenever uh, beeps at you like that, buddy. And then our regu regulatory proteins are naturally much, much smaller. But notice the freaking size of Titan. Titan is about three megadaltons in size. And so to give you an idea, whenever I was doing my dissertation, we would actually look at myosin heavy chain, I was looking at myosin heavy chain expression. And so you would have to run these on what's known as SDS page gels. And these gels effectively put a slight current through a sample of homogenized muscle tissue, which is something we would have biopsied out of these individuals. And from there, the current would pull the proteins through according to size. So the smallest proteins went the fastest and the furthest through it. The big proteins went a lot smaller. So when we're looking at things like um, uh, AKT, looking at, so essentially cellular signaling for muscle hypertrophy and otherwise, you could run those gels in two to three hours and have and be able to see what's going on. You still had to do what's known as uh, put them through Western blotting so you had to transfer them to another membrane and all this thing, but you could run the gel for everything you needed in about three hours. Myosin heavy chain was so big that we would have to run it overnight. So I would start it at about four or five in the afternoon and come in in the morning and between six and eight and take a look at it and see where it was at because it took that long with a constant current to pull the protein through it. If you try to go faster, you cook the gel because the temperature would be too high because the gel, which is acrylamide, is effectively a like jello. And you'd run it on what's known as a four to 8% acrylamide gradient with going with the 4% at the top. So it's a thinner gel and then a thicker gel at the bottom. You'd be very careful you didn't tear it. Titan, I had to run that typically for 24 hours and to further cause frustrations with running it, whenever you did so, you also had to, uh, it was a lot of fun, you would have to make a three to 6% gradient gel, and that gel was literally so flimsy, you could tear it just trying to make it. And you would have to let that gel actually set overnight because it would literally fall apart in the process. Hence, it was my white whale because it took a lot to go after it, and I was mostly unsuccessful. Good news is I did not Ahab myself. So I'm obviously here today. Now, myosin and titan are the thick filament components. The thin filaments, actin, troponin, tropomyosin, and nebulin. We've got a six of actin to one of myosin ratio. And the dystrophin glycoprotein complex is literally how we anchor the sarcomere to the sarcolemma. So let's talk about fiber types. Now, the way that you're gonna do this is literally through that muscle biopsy. We talked a little bit about it before. You're gonna take the needle after you've numbed the person, made a slight incision with the scalpel. You're going to then push the needle in, take a sample from the inside of that needle, uh, typically twice. And from there, you're going to then mount it. And by mount it, you mean you're gonna put it on a certain, it's like usually trigamp gum and then you're going to freeze it in isopentane. So it's gonna cause it to freeze at such a rate that it doesn't cause the muscle fiber to effectively have the water inside called the membrane to explode from freezing too quickly. That's, you're not gonna be able to look at it on a slide if you have that failure. You're gonna thinly slice it under what's known as a cryostat. And that happens to essentially be like a, a medical grade deli slicer only with very, very small samples of muscle protein. From there, you're gonna go ahead and mount that on a slide, and then you're gonna be able to see that under a microscope, specifically after you've gone through and done a variety of different uh, cellular, or a number of different processes with different chemical washes to get you know, essentially the expression you're looking for so that the slides will be staying the color you want, or the cells will be specifically staying the colors you want them to be because different fiber types stain differently with different chemical agents. So, the happy little biopsy, by using the suction, you actually make sure you pull a little bit of that fiber uh, sample in each time, so that way you're going to be able to get a good sample. And then that's the happy picture of putting the needle into somebody, but that's your final product when you do it correctly, specifically with the staining, where literally notice your type 1, your 2A, and your 2B. Also, guys, it's considered two, type 2X in humans. It's going to be the same thing. 
but you're going to literally see different colorations of those cells depending on the ATPase histochemistry. So that's literally staining based upon the myosin ATPase expression. Now, it's important to understand when it comes to our muscle fiber type, if we were to take a look at Diana's deltoids, Ehor's hamstrings, Jabari's quads, all of your muscles would have a variety of not just type 1, not in 2A and 2X, but you would see if we look at the individual fibers, you'd have certain fibers that literally inside of that individual muscle cell are going to express both the type 1 and the 2A or both the 2A and the 2B, and potentially even some that are going to have type 1, 2A, and 2X, 2B, all expressed at the same time. And these are what's known as hybrid fibers. So we're gonna have a certain amount of fiber in each cell that's pure, it doesn't matter what you do, it's always gonna be that fiber type. But then a decent amount of the rest of them are going to actually literally be hybrid fibers. About 50% of your muscle fiber type is genetics, as in thank you mom and dad or curse you mom and dad. And then the other 50% is based upon literally lifestyle. How do you train? How do you work out? How consistent are you? Most of us are born to be about a perfect 50-50 split between type 1 and type 2A. It's going to be training that's going to move this needle one direction or another. Now, when you take those individual fibers, so you do that muscle biopsy, and instead of mounting it on a slide, you're going to take individual fibers, and you're going to then uh, break them down using a... Uh, extraction buffer and some mechanical destruction, you're going to then run that fiber through this. Th this is the type of gel you'd run overnight. So it's on its own stir plate, so it has circulation. It's going to have a pumping system of fluid going through it over here, so that way that they're never going to overheat. And then you're going to then stain these gels after they go through. And you'll see the bottom bar here, guys, is type 1 fiber. The upper bar here is type 2A. And then if you this guy over here might be 2A slash 2X, but you can see literally right there and right there, those are great example of true hybrid fibers. And this was uh, work, this is examples of the work they did at Ball State uh, University. Now, when you actually look at the full like heavy chains and actin expression, notice you're also gonna have down here, it's gonna be that regulatory and essential light chains and you can see how there's some variability in expression a little bit of expression of difference in myosin heavy chains. This is that uh, alpha actinin where we have a contraction. And a number of other housekeeping proteins are going to be nested in here because you're taking the entire muscle fiber. Now, this gel right here, if you were to go above it, a probably significant different or distance, that's where you'd find titan because it is massive. So, once again, we're going to have a variety of fiber types, both essential and regulatory light chains, as well as notice guys with our fibers. Right here is actually a perfect example of that uh, type of hybrid fiber that literally has your 2X, your 2A, and your type 1 all expressed inside of that individual fiber. So if that person decided they're going to train like a lifter and lift heavy, and do a lot of strength power work, you'd see conversion more to the 2A. So you probably just see the 2X and the 1 disappear in there. If they're going to train like a long distance athlete, uh, do a lot of cardio, you would see it transition over to a type 1 fiber. And if they were going to go ahead and become a couch potato and do nothing and just sit, eat, and talk about their feelings, they would see an expression more into the type 2X isoform. And that's why those are sometimes referred to as your couch potato fibers because with any significant hard training, you're actually gonna convert away from type 2X into more type 2A. So, these hybrid fibers, once again, are going to change based upon the stressors that you're applying to the body. So, if we're going to be more of an endurance athlete, our one slash 2A, they're gonna to convert to one. Our 2A slash 2X, they're gonna to convert to 2A. Those hybrid fibers that all of them, they are going to go ahead and convert all the way to the type one. And then if you're gonna be a resistance training athlete, you're gonna see the hybrid converting to our 2A, and then our hybrid here also converting to our 2A. Just because the greater volumes of work is what causes that conversion. The reason you see this conversion to arguably not the fastest of fast switch is because the body is trying to maintain power output irregardless of physical activity. So if you happen to be sedentary, you're going to have better power output 
if you convert over to type 2x. The problem is, is you become obviously very, uh, you become easily fatigable. You're not able to put out a whole lot of effort for a long period of time, but it makes sense in a natural selection state of mind that it's probably more important to just be able to fight for a couple seconds than it would be to run away if you're sedentary. Because maybe you'd win and live to pass it on because who cares how good your endurance is if the lion's about to pounce on you. You might as well at least, you know, roll the dice and maybe win the fight rather than just, you know, trying to survive the other way. Does that make sense to you guys when it comes to fiber type conversion? So, slow twitch fiber, I'm sure you guys are relatively familiar with it. Very aerobic in nature. Don't do a lot of anaerobic work style with them, or they're just not as good anaerobically. They're not going to be contracting as fast. That's the key difference between slow and, twist, slow and fast switch fiber is going to be simply speed of contraction, which in turn gives us power output. It's not force. When they're relative slow twitch fiber and a fast switch fiber have the same cross-sectional area, they produce the same amount of force. The key difference is how quickly do they do so. Now, fast switch fibers, these are going to be the ones that are fatiguing out, uh, obviously faster, but they're going to be contracting at a much, much faster rate. And the way, based upon Henneman's size principle and otherwise, you're going to be literally recruiting more individual fast switch fibers per individual motor neuron than you are with your slow twitch fibers. They're going to have a much higher sarcoplasmic reticulum development, meaning the ability to both release and then bring back in calcium. And then our fastest of our fast switch are going to be even more so than that. They're going to be slightly faster than our 2A fibers. We're going to be getting a huge amount of neuron, uh, sorry, huge amount of fibers per neuron, and they are going to fatigue out incredibly quickly. They're only going to be lasting us mere seconds. So what we're going to find is that, once again, guys, the force is not different. The key is the number, the cross-sectional area we're contracting. So, Per motor unit of slow to fast switch, you create more force production from the fast switch fibers simply because they're recruiting more individual fibers, which in turn typically are going to have a much greater cross sectional area than those slow twitch fibers. And it turns out our mom and dad are big influencing factors on your muscle fiber type. There's a number of genes that have been identified that shows effectively, you know, your fiber type is related to a couple of components of your parents and your muscle fibers themselves are going to be specialized based upon our neurological recruitment of them and how that's going to work and remember how we live our life is going to cause us to contract those fibers or cause them to convert a little bit unfortunately as you get older your type 2 fibers tend to decrease at a faster rate than your type 1 and that's going to be due to some arguments with oxidative stretch and or oxidative stress, which in turn is going to cause what's referred to as a sarcopenia, which is effectively age-related muscle loss. So all of our muscles are going to have slow twitch and fast twitch. Some of them naturally do have a greater amount of fast twitch in them, things like our hamstrings, triceps. Others are naturally going to have more slow twitch fiber in them, things like our spinal erectors, our soleus. Uh, our postural muscles tend to be more type one, and it's that ATPase which is going to give us the key difference in the speed of contraction between our slow and fast fast twitch fibers, and along with having that bigger SR, which is going to allow for calcium to be released at a faster rate and be taken up faster. The motor units are going to be bigger, recruiting more individual fibers from the fast twitch compared to our slow. Slow twitch are going to be really good with aerobic endurance and hence really good low intensity exercise. Fast twitch are going to be much better at high speed, high power exercise. So when you're working with athletes, the actual muscle to examine that's going to be your best indicator of you know, their athletic performance and otherwise is going to be very relative to effectively what's going to be the important muscle in the sport. So when we're talking about a sprinter, it's probably something like the hamstrings. When you're looking at something like a basketball player and jumping ability, hamstrings could be important, glutes. I would not want to get a freaking biopsy. I, won't, I don't want to get another biopsy in general, but definitely not my glutes. Uh, if you think about the fact that you need to have a metal needle literally shoved into your buttock to go and take a sample. Um, I imagine none of you guys are on board for that. But also maybe things like looking at your, uh, 
a gastroc and your calf musculature would be useful. And when we're looking at swimmers, something like the deltoid, maybe the lat, uh, maybe the tricep are going to be pretty good indicators of, you know, what effectively fiber type predispositions they have to what advantages they might find in that sport. So any questions about muscle fiber type and otherwise before we keep on cruising? No? Cool. All right, guys. So basic contraction comes down to what's known as the sliding filament theory, which is going to be, we have these myosin cross bridges that are activated. They bind with actin, which re results in a change in the cross bridge because it pulled it forward, releases grab, pulls it forward, and so on and so forth. This is caused by the myosin head grabbing, going back, ATP goes in, which causes release, hydrolyze, causes it to spring back. Let's go forward again, grab, it's going to do that as long as it can hold on, or grab hold of actin, which means we're going to have to have the tropomyosin pulled off of those actin sites. The actual moving is what's referred to as the power stroke, the power stroke, and this is what's actually generating force. Now, calcium this is what's doing this, and that our intracellular calcium levels are incredibly low. It's going to be mostly extracellular and bound up to calcequestrin inside of our sarcoplastic retic reticulum, specifically in the terminal cisternae. Now, once we go ahead and get an action potential delivered, it's gonna cause this intracellular calcium levels to massively antique or in, increase, good Lord, sorry guys, which in turn is going to give us contraction. It doesn't have to move very far, literally two to four nanometers across the inside of the cell. And these T tubules are going to be going throughout the entire cell and they're gonna be interfacing with the SR via what's known as the riandidine receptors and DHP receptors, which are going to look like so in a few moments. So here we go, the action potential comes down the sarcolemma, down into the T tubules and goes into the SR, and that's where you find the DHP and riandidine receptors. Calcium here is gonna be bound to the calcium it's not gonna be released, and it's gonna go into the sarcoplasm where it in turn is going to bind to troponin C. So this actual interfacing between the T tubule membrane and the SR membrane is going to be from the DHP receptors on the inside of the T tubules into the riandidine receptors into the SR. So just figure since it's naturally going from the T tubules into the SR, DHP into the riandidine receptors and into the sarcoplastic reticulum. Now it's really cool because those DHP receptors inside of the T tubules have voltage sensors. So when it senses that voltage change, it's going to cause thanks to the calmodulin, the modifications and movement of the riandidine receptor through and then getting that signal to then proliferate into the sarcoplastic reticulum. So you can actually see here is going to be a actual picture of electron, electron scanning microscope where you can literally see the feet and the T-tubules themselves into that SR. So here's how muscle contraction works. First thing we're gonna have is acetylcholine is gonna be released at the neuromuscular junction by the motor neuron. Now these are released from vesicles. They're gonna float across the neuromuscular junction. It's then going to bind to the ligand gated receptors. Once it binds to the ligand gated receptor, it's going to eventually cause the voltage gated receptors to open once we hit threshold. This action potential is then going to go from the neuromuscular junction down the sarcolemma and into the tubules which is going to stimulate through the DHP into the riandidine receptors, the SR, to release calcium from calmodulin. This calcium is then going to bind to troponin C, which is going to cause troponin I to move troponin T, which in turn is going to move tropomyosin. So now the binding sites on actin are open. This in turn is going to allow myosin is immediately going to go and grab and from there, ATP is going to go and hydrolyze, cock the myosin head back through hydrolysis. It's then going to go ahead and attach onto myosin, and then the power stroke will occur, moving it on forward. Then a new ATP is going to come on, cause it to release, hydrolyze, it, then the ATP goes away, grabs, and once again, power strokes on through. This is going to occur as long as calcium is present, thanks to also having an action potential still being generated. As soon as the action potentials are going to quit being sent, that's where the calcium ATPase pump is going to be running and is going to pump the calcium back into the sarcoplastic reticulum where we'll rebind to 
calisoquestrin, which remember is a part of the terminal cisternae. Yay, muscular contraction. It's a lot. It's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. The nice thing is, at the end of this lecture, this is going to be up online, because, uh, sorry, and then yes, once calcium is no longer going to be bound to troponin, tropomyosin is going to shift back to the resting, and there's not going to be a spot for myosin to grab hold, so it's not going to use energy. And here is another great image of how you guys can go ahead and look at those events that are going to cause muscular contraction. Take your time with it, read through it, get yourselves acquainted with it, guys, because there will be quiz questions over it, and there are going to be exam questions about the ways in which muscle is going to go ahead and contract. So remember, myosin heads are going to be pulling that actin into the center, and it's going to go ahead and do so until it has effectively butted the two ends of actin up against each other, up against that end line in the center. So we're going to get muscle contraction because we've sent a signal from our nervous system to the muscle. This is going to be caused by action by acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, and this is going to eventually cause depolarization, which is going to send that action potential through the cell into the T2 mule, cause eventually the release of calcium. Calcium is going to bind to troponin. Troponin is going to move tropomyosin. Now that actin, you know, myosin can grab hold of actin, it's going to go ahead and do so. And it's going to keep pulling each other in as long as calcium is available. The calcium is going to be pumped through that calcium ATPase pump back into the SR in order to get the cell to repolarize and quit contracting once we no longer have an action potential is going in that direction. And we're using ATP to go ahead and make that occur. Now, your muscles function on what's known as an all or none response. So that means once that signal is sent to that individual nerve, we're going to, and we send enough action potential to the cell, we're going to get a contraction or not. We're not gonna halfway it. So what this means is when you get a muscle fiber individually contract, that fiber is gonna contract as hard as it can. It's not gonna be able to contract only partially as hard as it wants to. No matter what, that fiber is always going to contract maximum. If we don't send enough, neurotransmitter in order to get it to depolarize, we're not gonna have any contraction whatsoever. Now, we do get the difference between a twitch a summation and a tetanus because we send more action potentials, but once again, this is all based on the all or none response in that the way we're gonna produce more force is not by really getting that individual fiber to somehow contract harder. Instead, it's going to be by recruiting more and more fibers in the individual muscle to go ahead and get it to produce more force. So if we just had you guys slightly pushing on an object and then working with the maximal pushing, your initial like low intensity pushing is going to be mostly all done by your slow twitch fiber, which is good. You want to start by using slow twitch fiber because it is the most metabolically efficient. It uses energy aerobically, it doesn't contract as quickly, it's not as damaging to the body to contract it maximally. And then as we increase our force production, that's where we're gonna tap into those type two A's and then eventually into our type two B's once we're working our way up to maximal contraction. And that we're going to be recruiting those bigger and more powerful fibers as we go further on. Now, when it comes to muscle actions, just understanding the basics of movement. Agonist, remember guys, is gonna be the thing that's doing the movement. So if you're doing a biceps curl, that's your bicep. Antagonist is the muscle that's working against an opposition. That would be your triceps to keep you effectively from overstretching them by curling too far, I guess. And then your synergists are going to be muscles that are going to sometimes help and or fine tune the movement themselves. So if you're talking about doing the curl, that could be something like your brachioradialis is helping a little bit with helping with the movement while you're trying to do the vast majority of the work with the biceps. So, hooray, a great example of this graphically. You're also going to have neutralizers, which is another type of muscle that's going to work in essentially stopping a secondary action. So when the biceps contract, it also lifts your elbow. So your lats are going to naturally work as a neutralizer to keep your elbow from lifting itself up while you're curling a heavy load. Now, anytime that you are shortening the muscle actively, that is going to be what's known as a concentric motion. Anytime you're having the muscle hold the same position actively while contracting, that's an isometric contraction. And then anytime you're gonna have the muscle lengthening under load, that is what's known as an eccentric contraction. And sports are about all of the above. And in fact, what typically separates the highest level athletes is not the ability to contract the muscles, but it's the ability to relax the muscles and to do so more rapidly than their opposition. That tends to be the difference between your very good athletes and your best athletes. Now, when we are lifting weights and moving objects, typically this is gonna be what's known as isotonic. 
And this is going to be, literally means you're producing the same force, you're lifting the same load. It's actually iso-inertial lifting because it's gonna be the same object, but once it gets moving, inertia does help, so you don't have to keep pushing. Isokinetic is gonna be exercise where you're only able to move at the same speed, meaning no matter how you, hard you contract or how easily you contract, the object's still gonna move as quickly or move at the same speed. A great example of this is literally like rehabilitation, single joint isokinetic machines. There are some lifting machines on the market that are isokinetic in nature and they feel like you're in a freaking human trash compactor because no matter how hard you push, no matter what, the weight's still coming down at the same speed. I've had a chance to use a couple of these and I hated every single one of them. Uh, and that, it was just brutal. Then we also have what's known as the length tension relationship, which is at its normal resting length, that's typically where you have the best overlap between actin and myosin, so you're able to produce more force. It's when we get into more shortened and shortened positions that literally, literally we have myosin and actin heads, or we, the myosin has caused the actin heads to overlap, and now when the contraction is almost working slightly in opposition. So that if we're talking about the bicep, this would be your, where you're the strongest because you're in that mid-range where you have the best amount of actin and myosin overlap. The most shortened position where it's up against the end, that's where you're gonna have a lower force production, simply because, once again, the actin strands are by butting up against each other and working almost in opposition. And then when we're in the most lengthened position, we're going to be also in our weakest because we're barely going to have any overlap with between actin and myosin. So you're not able to produce as much tension actively. Now, there's a number of things that are gonna influence our ability to produce force. How many motor units we're gonna be recruiting is the biggest one first and foremost. Our fast twitch fibers tend to produce more force than our slow twitch simply because they're bigger, but a bigger muscle in general is gonna produce more force. How long the position is that muscle happens to be in when you start is going to influence how much force you're gonna produce, the angle that it happens to be done at is gonna be influencing it, and then obviously the speed in that Getting back to Archibald Vivian Hill, what we're gonna see is that inverse relationship between maximal velocity and maximal force production. And that we're gonna produce the greatest force typically at the lowest velocities. At the highest velocities, we typically only produce a very small fraction of our previous force production. So we're going to find that if we actually were having you guys lift maximally, you can produce a greatest amount of forces actually when you're doing an isometric contraction. You're even gonna be able to produce technically a little bit more force, lowering a maximal weight that's freaking miserable because now you're lowering, lowering a maximal weight and trying to keep it under control. Ehor, you can feel free to add this into your training. I'll watch, but I'm not gonna help because it's absolutely miserable. But uh, you can use eccentrics as a way to help increase maximal strength. The problem is your risk reward ratio is pretty jacked up, meaning it's, it's pretty dangerous. So I'm not a big proponent of it, but it's a method. But notice when you look at that tail end on the bottom right side of the graph there, guys, where you can't produce nearly as much force when we happen to be contracting at very high velocities. So we've got our agonist, antagonist, synergist, and neutralizers. We've got concentric, static, or isometric, and eccentric contractions, and we're gonna produce more force by recruiting more motor units. All joints are gonna have optimal angles for where we're gonna be able to produce a greater amount of force. The angle is gonna definitely depend on you know, where that muscle's inserted into our bones and then the load that's being placed and speed of action is going to always influence. You guys have any questions about the joys of muscle physiology uh, for everything that we're gonna talk about tonight? I looked into uh, your favorite uh, Archibald. I found yeah. a nice, yeah, I found a nice one. I'm using it in their discussion today. Nice man. Awesome. Any any other questions about anything we covered tonight? Anything you guys want me to go through? No, I'm good. Awesome. All right, guys. So your next lab is going to be the joys of the load carriage to nowhere. So, meaning the walking on the treadmill, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how to use the equipment, how to set everything up as far as using the metabolic cart. Um, Yehor, Dalton, and myself were able to get it up and running uh, without really much of an issue on Friday. So the goal would be for, you know, you guys to figure out a time that's going to work for you guys as a lab group, excuse me, to get everybody to come in so we can go ahead and show you guys how to use the metabolic cart, make sure you know how to calibrate it up and run everything. And then you guys are going to be able to start recording each other on the long walks to nowhere. 
And remember guys, when we do these labs, everybody's got to help out and you set the time that works for your group. And I've got extra keys to the front door of the lab. So you guys can come in in hours that are obviously outside of class time. You know, like obviously tonight, if you guys wanted to, I try to, I want to be done with lecturing for you guys by seven o'clock each night, because then from there, you guys could literally come in here, do your labs and be done with it. And, you know, we use that, those groups for the first lab. We can change them if you guys want for the second lab. It doesn't bother me whatsoever. So any questions, comments, concerns about that? as far as starting the next lab, and then obviously everything else that you guys are working on. No? You guys are good? Well, 